Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucia Analich. Um, I'm from Analich Consulting and immediate past president of the South African Association for Food Science and Technology. And I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, presentation today, uh, which is all about whole genome sequencing for food safety. Before we get to the actual talk, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping rules with you. Firstly, please note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of SAFOST. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SAFOST website within seven days. For best viewing of the presentation material, please click on Maximize, which is in the upper right corner of the slide window, and then Restore to return to normal view. Also, please turn off other applications that you might be running that require internet connection to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, so please have your speakers or headphones on and the volume turned up so that you can hear clearly. Uh, a telephone connection is unfortunately not available. Questions should be submitted during the presentation through, uh, to the presenter, and you can use the questions section at the right hand side of your screen. You can click on the drop down arrow at the section called questions, then type your question in and then um, click submit and it'll come through to all of us and uh, we'll, I will then moderate the questions at the end of the presentation as well. When typing your questions, please refrain from using any acronyms uh, other than, for example, whole genome sequencing, which is something we will all understand, WGS, to allow the moderator to easily read them out. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Nigel French. So Nigel is Chief Scientist for the New Zealand Food Safety Science and Research Centre. Uh, and it's actually a resource that I use quite a lot. And Distinguished Professor of Food Safety and Veterinary Public Health at Massey University in New Zealand. He's also Founder and Executive Director of Massey University's Infectious Disease Research Centre, which specialises in research and training in molecular, and genomic epidemiology, food safety, and the control of infectious diseases. Nigel is a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, as well as a fellow of Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, FASANS. He holds an honorary professorship as well at the University of Otago Medical School in New Zealand. Nigel uh, is a person that I met last year in Sydney, Australia, when we had our annual ICMSF meeting, and uh, we invited Nigel to be a consultant for the group um, in assisting us to write our next book. And I'm very happy to say that Nigel is joining us again this year for the same reason. However, we're going to be doing it virtually this time for obvious reasons. So I was so thrilled when Nigel accepted my invitation to speak at a SAFOST event such as this one. And the topic for today is whole genome sequencing for food safety from global to local applications. Nigel, thank you so much for joining us today and for being prepared to speak with us about this topic. And over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Lucia, can you hear me okay and see my screen all right? We can hear you perfectly and your screen is very clear. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and it's a real honour to be able to uh, present to you. It's nine o'clock in the evening here. I understand it's a similar time in the morning there, um, but it's a real pleasure to, to be able to talk to you about this subject. Um, just moving the slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. So just by way of overview, what I hope to cover over the next 40 minutes um, is first of all an introduction to the kinds of technology that we use for whole genome sequencing. An overview of the applications, obviously with particular reference to food safety. Um, a bit about how we interpret whole genome sequencing data for food safety. And I understand this is quite an important area, things like how we interpret things like SNP distances and alleles and all that. I hope to cover a bit of that in some 
in some detail um, and then talk a bit about some applications and particularly some of the applications that I've been directly involved with as a researcher and somebody working uh, for government, um, particularly our Ministry of Health and Ministry of Primary Industries. And those applications I mentioned at this first slide go from the global application right the way down through to the local application. So we're talking about global transmission of pathogens, and then I'll end up talking about transmission with a single, within a single food uh, production plant. And then I'll finish up with some issues that we really need to consider for the future of using whole genome sequencing in the food industry. So first of all, um, I mean, not knowing anything about the backgrounds of the, the listeners, I, I'm, I'm starting from a fairly uh, uh, simplistic approach. Um, obviously, it's sequencing of the entire genetic blueprint of the organism. So it's the entire DNA sequence. And in this case, I'm just going to be talking about bacteria. The advantage of whole genome sequencing is that it's higher resolution than other methods. So you're much more able to discern differences and similarities than with lower resolution, such as pulse field gel electrophoresis. There are many technologies that are available, and these are the ones that are probably the ones that are most used. It's not exclusively these ones, but they fall into what are called second generation or short read sequencing. And the Illumina technology seems to be the dominant technology there. And then we have single molecule technology, the Pacific Biosciences or PacBio, this is called a third generation, a long read, and the Oxford Nanopore, of which the Minion is one particular device. It's a very small device about the, uh, the size of a mobile phone, whereas a PacBio sequencer is much larger. It's a standalone machine with a larger footprint. The types of analyses that you can do include whole genome is single nucleotide or SNP detection, whole genome, multi-local sequence typing, I'll explain these in a second. You can look at the antimicrobial resistance and virulence patterns and really explore the genomics of these pathogens in some detail. What I'm not going to discuss are some of the other omics or related technologies, so transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, metagenomics, metabarca, all of these are techniques that we uh, we use, um, but there isn't time to discuss those today. So first of all, just about the technology, I mean, basically you start off with your bacterial culture, which you may have isolated from a final product, from a person, or from an environment. You extract the DNA, you break the DNA up into these short fragments. Those are then amplified up, and then they're put onto the machine, and the machine then sequences each of those amplified fragments, millions and millions of them, and then basically they're reconstructed to create what we understand as the genome sequence. That's a very simplistic approach and there are many more features to that, but essentially the other key piece of information in order to make sense of the data, you have your raw read data, you have your SNPs and your allele calls, but you need this other information, the metadata, the epidemiological information is absolutely crucial for decision making. And this is a very good publication here that I'd recommend if you haven't seen it already, on whole genome sequencing by the WHO. So the kinds of applications that we see, um, first of all, identifying the source and transmission of foodborne pathogens. Outbreak investigations are really obvious and big application of this technology. Source attribution, so this is determining the source of sporadic cases in particular. We use this for Campylobacter in New Zealand, is a very good example. You can also, by calibrating the molecular clock using the genome sequence, date the time and origin of incursions into a country and into a processing environment. So this is where we're talking about the global and local scales. And then within environments, you can look at source tracking, even looking along production chains between farm transmission in processing environments, and also uh, helping you to locate resident strains and to help you eradicate pathogens from uh, a food production environment. For example, it could be a farm, it could be a factory, or it could be something on a bigger scale. The reason, one of the reasons why it's taken off so much is the decline in sequencing costs. And you can see that it's really just a fraction, this is on a log scale, of what it used to be just um, two decades ago. So, well, in outbreak investigation, I mean, generally speaking, and this is from the CDC website, um, outbreak, whole genome sequencing compared to previous technologies resolved in more outbreaks being solved and fewer cases per outbreak. Now that's better, uh, helps to focus the mind 
of everyone involved to protect public health, but also to minimise impact on food businesses and to international trade as well. So this is very important outcomes of whole genome sequencing. And then there are other applications. This is a big initiative by Mars and IBM. This is actually using not, not single isolate genome sequencing, but metagenomics, establishing what's the normal and abnormal flora in food supply chains. You can also use them to help diagnostic test development, look at evolution, antimicrobial resistance, virulence, and also understand things like the relationship between the genetics and certain types. So it might be heat resistance, it might be biofilm formation or resistance to sanitizers and biocides. And this can be really helpful in determining the appropriate interventions. There are a growing a number of sequences available for everybody to use. And these are two international databases which have gathered in, in sequencing data from around the world. There's the GMI and then there's Genome Tracker. And you can see nearly half a million sequences now available. Um, many of them, Salmonella, you can see Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter, Vibrio. The numbers of these sequences available for global comparisons is huge. Now, this is really great for identifying sources of outbreaks, but uh, in the case of false positives, you can also see that there are potential pitfalls with, say, being falsely identified as a source of a major outbreak in another country. So we need to be aware of some of these issues. I'm going to talk now about how we interpret whole genome sequence data. There's a lot to this, um, but what I'm going to focus on is just two of the most prominent approaches that are taken, and they're very closely related. One is SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism analysis, and the other one is multi-locus sequence typing or allele-based analyses. Now, just to explain a bit about these, so say this is a genome, and these are the genes around the outside. We call it locus, multi-locus, because often you'll use a part of the gene, which is called a locus, and then within the sequence, you might have differences, and these are your SNPs, or single nucleotide changes or polymorphisms. So SNPs are single nucleotide changes. These are what result from mistakes in replication and enable you to look at similarities and dissimilarities from isolates that may or may not be epidemiologically or environmentally linked. Then we have uh, allele-based multi-locus sequence typing, and you'll often see the term CGMLST, which stands for core genome MLST and whole genome MLST. I'll explain these in a minute. And these uh, are changes in sequence at the gene or the locus level. Now, an allele is a unique sequence for a given gene. So you basically assign different alleles based on the whole sequence. So two alleles might be a single, or two isolates might be a single allele difference, but this locus itself may have multiple SNPs in it. So SNPs tend to have more differences than alleles. Now, this method is better for certain bacteria that tend to swap large chunks of DNA through recombination. Now, just to explain how um, we interpret SNPs in a little bit more detail, and this is motivated by an example considering listeria in ice cream. And here we're looking at environmental strains from ingredient suppliers and a final product. So this is a completely made up example, but it's just to illustrate how it's done. So you can imagine a wild bird population that's got listeria monocytogenes, and it's got a huge genome, four million bases, and this is part of the genome. And it has these sites that are going to vary as I go through the example. So there are five sites that vary. These are called the polymorphic or variant sites. And the other ones which really don't provide any information are the invariant sites. Now you can imagine that um, this particular um, isolate, this particular bird or population might um, occupy two different areas. And over time, you can see there's a sequence change here in this strain, uh, which is not in this strain. And there are ingredient companies here and ingredient companies here. And these uh, have different sequence uh, SNP types as a result of that. Now, as a result of just replication and mistakes being made over time, you gradually see the accumulation of more of these SNPs or polymorphisms. You can see supplier A has got a change here to here, B a change here to here, and C has got two, two changes, and D has got one change here. Now, we just extract what's called the SNP profile. So this is just the variant sites that I've highlighted in blue there. And that gives you these SNP profiles here. And then what you can do is arrange these into a matrix according to the supplier. And I've added the final product here at the bottom 
And you can see that if you look at the differences here, supplier A and B differ by two SNPs. Um, so it's these, uh, the T and the G differ there. Um, and you can compare all of them, pairwise comparisons. But this one here, you can see B is identical to the final product. Now we put that into a tree where the horizontal lines represent the number of SNPs. And you can see that the final product and supplier B have a zero SNP difference. A differs by two SNPs, so one, two, and C and D differ by one, two, three SNPs from the final product. So what you would conclude from here is that B has the most similarities, so supplier B is most likely the source of contamination in that final product. Now, moving on then from SNP typing to allele-based typing or multi local sequence typing, very often you'll see uh, seven gene schemes, but with whole genome sequencing, these are based on Sanger sequencing. With whole genome sequencing, we move up to thousands of genes. So core genome MLST, usually greater a thousand, so Listeria is about 1,700 genes. Whole genome, about 4,000 genes. And what you end up here, rather than a SNP profile, is you end up with an allele profile. So this is a gene, 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 gene along here. So this one being the first one discovered has an allele profile of one, 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 one. Then this one differs at these four, five loci, and so they've got two as opposed to one. I'll just walk through another example here. So again, motivated by a similar example with the ice cream um, ingredient supplier. This is instead, this is a gene, one, another gene, a separate gene and a separate gene. And you can see the slightly different sizes and different uh, sequences in those genes. And your suppliers have, for each of these individual genes, have a sequence which is characterized by these variations. Now, what you do here now is assign an allele number. So this, these one, two, three, these all differ from each other. So these are alleles one, two, three, and four. But supplier D in this case has an identical allele to the final product one, so they have the same number. And this is then repeated for all of the genes. And then you collect the allele profile across those loci, and you end up with this kind of thing. So supplier A has a profile of 1111, supplier B 2111, supplier D C 3211, and D and the final product in this case have the same allele profile. I think you can look at the distances here and you can see that the one with zero allele distances is supplier D from the final product and therefore you'd conclude in this case that supplier D was the most likely source. Now you can also look at the SNP differences. You can count up the number of individual changes, and you can see there's many more. And this is what differs between the SNPs and the alleles. You'll often see there are fewer allele differences compared to SNP differences. But the end uh, conclusion is the same that supplier D, in this case, is the most likely source. Now, um, we often, I did show a picture of a tree earlier on. That was an example of a rooted tree. You'll see many, many different tree shapes and sizes. And these are just some that I've been using in the presentation. There isn't any time to describe all of these in detail, but essentially the horizontal distance in these types of trees is proportional to the number of SNPs or the number of allele differences. This is called a minimum spanning tree. And again, the numbers here represent the number of allele differences. You can see there's just one between those two and 600 or so between those. And this is called an unrooted tree, and this is a circular tree. And you'll see all of these different types in various uh, uh, documents. Now, how do we interpret these? So one way that is uh, gaining in popularity is the use of what are called zip codes. So this is an example of a zip code that we use in New Zealand in our Listeria database. And what it is, you read it from right to left. So two isolates that have the same number here, or the same whole long set of numbers, um, are indistinguished, uh, are actually the same, they have zero allele difference. Isolates that are the same up to here, but differ here, differ by three alleles. The same up to here, but differ there would be seven allele differences. Some examples down here, isolate one, you can see has identical profile. So we would conclude that those would differ, uh, don't differ at all. They have an identical allele profile. This one differs at this end, but it's the same for the others. So therefore you'd include, conclude that this had three at least well, one to three allele differences. Now the advantage of this is you don't look at trees, this just tells you instantly whether or not you have a pair of isolates similar by certain allele distances. Now what represents alleles that are 
similar enough that you'd conclude that they were the same part of the same outbreak. And this is the million dollar question, and there's still a lot of discussion and debate about this. Uh, but I would point you to some recent papers that indicate for listeria, for example, that around seven allele differences you can consider them part of the same outbreak, and that's based on the distribution of allele differences within um, groups of isolates which are known to cluster into outbreaks. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's a general rule of thumb. And similarly, when you're looking at SNP distances, single nucleotide polymorphism distances, differences, um, what well, this is from a paper by um, Peitling in 2018, which I'm going to use a few bits of uh, information from that paper. He used three conditions to determine whether you, it would support an, the same source outbreak, outbreak or the same source say, of ingredient to a uh, supplier. And the three bits of information here are because we're using SNPs in this example, SNP distance, so it's a slightly larger number, fewer than 21, you'd say yes maybe 21 to 100 and doesn't if it's greater than 100. And there's these two other bits of information which I'll explain in a second. But this is a very rough guide and it does depend very much on the bug, bacteria that you're looking at and the setting. And this is again from my paper, you can see E. coli, listeria, salmonella, um, the number of SNPs, these are ones, all ones known to be part of an outbreak. Most of them have fewer than 21 SNPs, but some of them do have larger numbers of SNPs as well. Um, but generally speaking, that's a kind of rule of thumb that people use. Now, I mentioned bootstrap support. Now, this uh, gives you the degree of confidence that you have that a particular branch in a tree exists. And this is important because if you're very confident in that, then you're more likely to conclude that they are part of the same outbreak. If you're less confident, you're less likely, basically. So if you have 100% bootstrap, you're very confident, and 50% mean you're less confident. And it's basically done by sampling from the data repeatedly with replacement. And then the third bit of information is the tree shape itself. So this kind of tree shape where your isolates, say from your supplier or from your food and your person, form a distinct group. That's called a monophyletic group. You'd be confident evidence of an epidemiological link. If your group includes other isolates that are not known to be from the supplier or from the outbreak, it's called a paraphyletic group. There's some evidence, but you may not be as confident. But if they're in different groups, then it's called polyphyletic, and you'd be less confident that they would be part of the same outbreak. So there's things to be mindful of when you're interpreting SNP and allele-based differences, is that bacteria evolve very differently. Listeria evolves differently to Campylia, Bacter to E. coli to Salmonella. They have different mutation rates, um, different molecular clock rates, some are more likely to swap big chunks of DNA with others, um, others are less likely to. And the evolutionary forces that are around in the environment in which your bugs are growing in will also have a big effect on the population structure and how you interpret that when you're doing your analysis. Um, and this is just from a paper which is often cited, which shows the relationship between the estimated mutation or substitution rates for different types of pathogens but also the period over which you're sampling. So if you're sampling over a short period, you expect your mutation rates to be up here. And it's reasonably consistent, this picture, but you can see there are some differences between pathogens. And this is from a study which I'm going to describe later. This is a salmonella type of neuron, which fits roughly onto that line. But there is some variation, and that's why you need to know the characteristics and the evolution of your bug in order to be able to interpret it properly. The other thing to point out is that laboratory and computing errors happen. So you get false positive SNPs and you can get false negative SNPs, and this can affect your alleles as well. The errors um, between the genomes can result in, in uh, they're unlikely to result in major changes to trees, but they are worth noting, and you need to be aware of the issues that can arise. And these are described in this paper here. I won't go through these in detail, but just to make this point here. Point mutations inherited finally should form the basis of your phylogenetic analysis. Anything else really shouldn't be, so you really should try and focus on what these are. But you can get false positives, so growing up bugs in vitro can generate SNPs, and you can get false negatives, so failure to assemble repeat regions can result in areas where you don't identify SNPs that should be present. So there are a number of different reasons for getting false positives and false negatives. So food safety application interpretation. So I'm just going to go, go through a few examples here. Um, again, this is taken from that Peitling uh, 
2018 paper. The three different things I'm going to describe, identifying the source of an outbreak, matching food isolates from one company to another company, so this is an ingredient to a final product company, and the question of do we have resident strains or are we dealing with new introductions? And another big uh, important point to make here, which I've kind of made already, but uh, um, epidemiological information and other trace back and other data are really crucial. You, don't, you can't just use the whole genome sequencing data, you have to bring everything else in. Um, and bacteria with very different genomes can come from the same source. And likewise, ones that are identical could come from different sources. So you can't necessarily infer causality just from those sequences. And I'll, I'll show an example later. Um, and the goal really is to combine epidemiological information with the whole genome sequencing data if you really want to, to get a good um, and accurate result. So identifying the source of an outbreak, this is an example here from the paper, a flower outbreak involving sugar toxin E. coli 0121 in 2016. The red labels are the clinical isolates from people, the green labels are from the flower. You can see a very high, near 100% bootstrap support for a single monophyletic group with a very small number of SNPs. So you'd be really confident um, that the flower in this case is highly likely to be the source of the outbreak. These are ones that are not related to the outbreak up here. Similarly, matching food isolates from one company to environmental isolates from another company. So this would be your ingredient supplier situation. Um, here we've got an example of Listeria monocytogenes from ice cream. Um, the final product, you can see a high bootstrap support for this group, which is slightly more variable because you may have different um, repeated introductions from your ingredient supplier, but they all either belong to the supplier or to uh, the, the ingredient supplier or to the producer of the final product. And the number of SNP differences is within that range where you would you'd, you'd infer causality. So you might you would conclude from this that the supply the ingredient supplier is likely to be the source in the final product. And then last of all, um, are you getting repeated introductions into your, into your uh, food production environment or do you have um, resident strains which are just persisting, say in biofilms or whatever in the environment? And this is an example again from that paper, this is salmonella, collected over a six year period and again high bootstrap support, nearly 100% for this one, um, small numbers of SNPs and you can see that no matter what the time is, you've got uh, ones going all the way back um, from an early period um, to, through to a more recent period, they are very similar. And you'd conclude from this um, that uh, the salmonella in a food factory is likely to have persisted over that time, and because it's close to a clinical isolate, may well have been the source of that particular human uh, case. So that's just some examples of how uh, you can use SNP, and, and the SNP is very similar to the allele-based approach as well, so you can use those uh, in a very similar way. Now I'm just going to move on uh, to, to talk about some examples of the work that I've been involved with, my group's done here, uh, and also in collaboration with international collaborators. And this is where I'm going to talk from global to local applications. And the first one I'm going to talk about is a study of sugar toxin E. coli 0157, which I'm sure you all know is a really nasty um, pathogenic E. coli, uh, commonly associated with ruminants. And what we did here was look at the global transmission of this around the world by whole genome sequencing isolates from many, many places. So the Netherlands, England, Wales, Scotland, Sweden, all around, Japan, New Zealand. Um, and you can see the different human case rates. And when they started, New Zealand was relatively late, around 1993. And you can see the kind of tree that you see from all of this. And what we can do is calibrate the clock, infer movements between countries, and the kind of output you see is this here. You can infer that there have been movements between countries at certain time points. And focusing down in New Zealand in the right hand corner here, you can see there's evidence of at least three separate introductions, all of them in the second part of the 20th century, uh, around about the time when we had live cattle imports. And you can convert this into a moving picture. So this is taking place, uh, going right the way back to the origins. Um, in Northern Europe, its movements over time are up to 1960 now. You can see the first cases, uh, first isolates in New Zealand, then the second isolates in New Zealand, evidence for New Zealand exporting to other countries as well. So you can get those kinds of dynamic pictures. So that's uh, a global example. Um, the next example is looking at 
uh, regional transmission. And here I'm looking at Salmonella, in this case, one particular strain or cirovar of Salmonella typhimurium called DT160. And this caused, uh, was a dominant strain in New Zealand for 14 years. It was published in this paper here, so this you can see. Now we genome sequenced the isolates. This was the earliest human cases right at the center of this unrooted phylogenetic tree. It's actually at the fulcrum of the tree. And you can see as you move through time, you've got increasing diversity as this pathogen evolved over time. And this is a really good example of a single point introduction followed by evolution of a pathogen within our situation, within an island environment. And this was interesting because it caused a die-off in small passerine birds. So the sparrows and silver eyes, which are New Zealand birds, were the first uh, victims of Salmonella DT160. The first human case was in 1998 in South Island in Christchurch. And then it subsequently progressed very rapidly from South Island, it's focused in South Island to North Island, and spilled over into the food uh, production system and into people. Now I'm just going to show a map of how quickly this spread. So you can see an example. Uh, the green dots in this map, I'll just show a movie in a second, are the Typhimurium DT1s. So these are the ones we're interested in. And these are the first few cases in Christchurch in South Island of New Zealand. Just like way of contrast, I'm showing a strain in blue here, which is a sheep associated strain called Salmonella Brandenburg. And this is another type of murine associated with cattle. Now you have to look really quickly because um, the speed at which this spread from its focus in Christchurch within just a few months, right to the top of North Island and the bottom of South Island was quite extraordinary. And we believe this was due to the movement in wild bird populations. So you can see that's already within a year um, transmission right the way across, whereas those other strains were staying relatively locally. So um, that's just, we're, we're just up to the fifth year. I'm not going to show the entire time series, but you kind of get the picture that it spread very rapidly over that time period. So we could also use the genome sequences to show that the size of that bacterial population increased exponentially over that time period when the human cases were happening. And there was evidence that it was transmitted repeatedly from wild birds to people through food multiple times throughout that outbreak. And the common ancestor of all of the strains was around about the time of the first human case and the first die-off in those wild birds in the South Island. Um, and then there's a footnote to this story, which is really interesting, is that we've done all this sequencing on these Salmonella DT160 isolates. Then a colleague at the University of Melbourne, Debbie Williamson, um, had also got some sequences from Australia of the same serotype. And she said it was really unusual because most of their sequences fell into this green group here, but they had a group here which sat very differently away from the main cluster of cases in Australia. And they wanted to know um, whether these possibly could have come from New Zealand. So we shared our genome sequences with them, and indeed we found they sat right within the uh, New Zealand cluster. And so there was good evidence of transmission between Australia and New Zealand. And then when we found out a bit more about the epidemiology, it turned out that this was a group of people who traveled in a cruise ship from New Zealand, from Auckland in New Zealand, to Sydney in Australia, and, and were uh, infected originally in New Zealand. So it's a good example of how you can look at between country spread, and it's described in this paper here. And the next study I just want to talk about is uh, the regional transmission study. So this is a study conducted in Africa. We've looked at isolates of Salmonella in Tanzania and Kenya. Um, and the Kenyan isolates were from people, the Tanzanian isolates mainly from uh, um, food and environmental sources. And it was part of this bigger project. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk in detail about this, but essentially we looked throughout the food chain and we did some modeling of the food chain. We sampled repeatedly from different parts of the food chain. Um, and we also did um, genome sequencing. And the genome sequencing showed that the strain of Salmonella typhimurium, which is um, a very virulent strain in Africa in particular, it's ST313, we only found that in human cases, whereas there are other ones like the poultry associated Salmonella interitidis, which was found in both humans, which is the squares, and in uh, animal isolates and the environment, which are these ones here. And so we could use this to, to basically show that there was no evidence of foodborne or animal zoonotic transmission of strain 313, but there was evidence of strain transmission of the poultry associated sequence type 11. There's a lot more to this story, which is described in a paper which is about to come out in clinical infectious diseases.
The next thing I want to talk about briefly is a national study. So this is in 2015, um, we had the emergence of a brand new strain of Campylobacter jejuni. Um, it was called sequence type 6964, and this was unusual in New Zealand because it was resistant to fluoroquinolones and to tetracyclines. And we have very, very low levels of resistance in both poultry and in people up until this point. And this is the kind of newspaper clipping that the food industry obviously was uh, uh, dreads this kind of publicity. Um, we used uh, whole genome sequencing to investigate this. The first cases appeared in our Sentinel site in human cases, and it was very quickly found in three of our major poultry companies in the North Island of New Zealand and in the breeder flocks, all resistant to these antimicrobials. And we saw a sharp rise, which has persisted through to the present day of antimicrobial resistance in poultry and in people. And it was also associated with outbreaks of food as well. So we wanted to know through genome sequencing, how long has it been in New Zealand? How has it been transmitted? Uh, what's driven that emergence? What's the main source of infection? How has it evolved? But all of these, you can only address these with whole genome sequencing. But the other techniques, they would have all been identical. You simply wouldn't have been able to discriminate between them. Um, so we sequenced using both long read and short read sequencing. Over 200 isolates, it's described in this paper, which came out last year, if you're interested in the details. And we could show that it was already evolving separately in the different poultry suppliers. So companies uh, B and uh, uh, A, for example, on this side, all associated with human cases in here as well, and company C on this side evolving separately, and they're geographically distant from each other as well. We were interested in how it got to transmit so quickly in the poultry industry. We were interested in within company, but also evidence for local spread or spread through the kind of contact networks that you see in the industry. So the movement of feed, movement of day-old chicks, and movement of personnel. There's lots of movements around uh, the poultry industry uh, within New Zealand. Uh, and using whole genome sequence, we can then look at the genetic distance, so example of a tree here, and then we can compare it with things like the road distance or the Euclidean, the, the crow fly distance, but we can also use other distance matrices such as the feed network and other networks as well. You can see there's a generally a similarity between the genetic distance, road distance and companies from by comparing a dendrogram of both the genetic distance and the road distance. But to cut us a long story short, we used a range of different network approaches feed, live birds, hatching eggs, waste. But what came out very strongly was the best model showed transmission between within parent companies, but also evidence of road network spread. And in particular, uh, the feed network came out as very strongly significant too. So this is a, a good example of how you can use genome sequencing to infer regional transmission within, uh, in this case, a primary industry, uh, the, the poultry industry. And again, it's described in detail here. Um, evidence that it came in rel relatively recently, you can see transmitted through these different approaches, human infection, all the companies were associated with human infection and the basis of resistance is described in this paper. Now, the next thing to talk about is uh, an outbreak investigation. Now, this is not foodborne, but it's a really good example. Um, this was in uh, a place called Havelock North in New Zealand, um, where there was a heavy rainfall event and a huge outbreak of Campylobacter cases uh, associated with the drinking water supply uh, in this particular town. Now, this is one of the largest outbreaks of waterborne outbreaks of any pathogen anywhere in the world, and certainly the largest in New Zealand. There were 8, 000, over 8,000 cases, uh, 42 people were hospitalized, three developed complications, and four of them died. So it was a really serious outbreak, the biggest instance about a waterborne disease in New Zealand and a big loss to the businesses in the area. A typical point source outbreak, chlorination solved the problem. It was an untreated groundwater supply uh, that was the responsible for the outbreaks. This is again described in a paper published this year, just this month actually, um, in the Journal of Infection if you're interested in detail. And these are the genotypes determined by whole genome sequencing from that time period. And to cut a long story short, we found that Although there were many different strain types involved in the outbreak, so the green of the outbreak cases, we had really good evidence that the reticulated water supply was involved, the bull water from the wells, but also 
from sheep grazing in the paddocks around the bore wells. So the most likely source was a heavy rainfall event washing sheep fecal material into the wellheads, getting into the untreated groundwater supply and causing that big human outbreak. And genome se sequencing, high resolution genotyping was really crucial to identifying the source. Now, just to mention, um, there are a couple of things just before I go on to the plant mapping. Um, briefly, there are really, some really good tools for online genomic epidemiology. This is an example, it's not a, a foodborne pathogen, um, but it is an example of one um, where, hopefully it did work before. Okay, I won't be able to show you that one, unfortunately. Um, but it was a very nice example showing a transmission between farms uh, in, in New Zealand of a, of a cattle pathogen. We also use um, genome sequencing for source attribution and we did a case control study this year. It was a very unique design where we had cases of Campylobacter and controls and we were able to divide our cases up into whether or not they were poultry or ruminant associated according to the genome sequencing and an attribution model. So this is quite an unusual uh, approach. But what it meant was we could then look at risk factors for cattle associated cases differently from, from poultry associated cases. And this is an example here where you see a really strong risk factor for raw milk consumption, particularly associated with cattle cases. This is the link to the full report. A paper's been submitted if you're interested, but it's an application, a unique case control study using whole genome sequencing. Now, uh, lastly, just local transmission studies. So this is where we're looking uh, within production plants and using genome sequencing. This is work that's being done through the Food Safety Science Research Center with multiple companies and multiple different pathogens. We call it plant scale micro mapping. This is an approach that was previously applied to transmission of antimicrobial resistant organisms in hospitals. We basically use the same techniques. We identify entry points, resident strains, we can look at transmission chains, and we can also look to see if there's evidence of resistance to things that might be used for CIP um, processes. We, this is just a snapshot. This is a made up example because obviously I can't use real uh, food processing plant maps, but we basically get the maps and we get the genome sequences, and then we're able to interrogate these as interactive web-based maps. The timeline along the bottom, you can create a database as well. And then you can basically ask the question, so this cluster here are associated with these particular locations in the plant. You can look for resident strains and you can look for entry points uh, in those plants. And this is proving to be a very popular approach. And we use this software called um, MicroReact. We've adapted it for our particular purposes. And there are commercial systems available as well. I think, uh, I'm not exactly sure whether Traxar uses whole genome sequencing, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Um, but our system is developed, uh, uh, is, I think is a, a lot more expensive, but um, it's a similar approach. Um, we also develop our own bespoke database, and this has been another initiative within New Zealand for Listeria, but we're also expanding it out for other pathogens as well. We had a project where we looked, we asked all the stakeholders what their attitudes were to start with to make sure we were going along the right track. We then got isolates from food, from clinical isolates. I've developed a database, we're using micro mapping as I showed before, and we're combining this with laboratory based studies to look for resistance in Listeria. And this involves researchers across five of our research organizations in New Zealand. And this is the kind of pattern we've got over 900 isolates on our database now, uh, including clinical and non clinical isolates. And this is just one of the particular strains of Listeria um, that we are looking at. And you can see the allele differences in those strains. Uh, access to industry is only provided if they provide data. Uh, minimal information is available to all users, so they'll just know whether they're clinical or non-clinical isolates, and we add additional global data. But if they provide their own isolates, they can see where theirs sit, and they have access to their own additional data over and above the genome sequencing data. So they can just see where theirs sit with reference to others, but they don't know the details of the others. And then we can tailor the analysis. This is just the analysis that's used on there, and we can use that Listeria zip code that I mentioned earlier. So, uh, really finishing up now, future challenges, there are many challenges. So, at the moment, as you probably gathered, there's the real need for clear guidance on interpretation of both SNP and, SNP and allele-based whole genome sequencing data, and a strong need for standardization, accreditation, harmonization, all of these things that are really important, particularly when you have multi-jurisdictional events or outbreaks, 
and these need to be standardized right the way through the process and really strong quality control. And we need very good governance and management of these databases to, to maximize the benefit of using those and avoiding risks, unnecessary risks to the food industry. And there are many different uh, uh, sources of information on these, um, including this WHO document, which I just showed the link to earlier, discusses this uh, in some detail. And there's some pathogen specific approaches too. So just to summarize uh, before we get the questions, so whole genome sequencing now used extensively, increasingly. We're certainly using it in the last couple of years. We've seen an exponential increase in the use here in, in New Zealand by the food industry, by the government. Um, we're using it a lot for COVID. I've been very closely involved with the genome sequencing for COVID in New Zealand as well. You can see the applications from looking at global transmission right the way through to looking at transmission within processing environments, as well as for outbreak investigation, source attribution, database visualization tools that are improving. Um, there are many challenges ahead, um, including the ones I mentioned earlier and also big legal issues too. And I haven't talked about any of the other related technologies, that's uh, for another day. Many, many people have been involved in the work that I've described there. Um, I can't thank them all, um, but I'll leave that slide up just to, uh, to so you can see uh, the people that have been involved in this work. And I'll hand over for questions. Thank you very, very much indeed for an excellent presentation. Um, you've taken a relatively complex subject and you've been able to make it uh, so clear for those of us who have not, uh, you know, a lot of experience perhaps in this field of, of the whole, you know, genetic and the sequencing of the, of the genome and how to interpret it. And the applications are clearly incredibly powerful of this technology. So uh, to our first question, um, the question is, hi, how about CG slash whole genome MLST? Do you manage allele uncalled in one sample but present in another? And do you consider it different or do you exclude it? Uh, well, that's a good, a good question. So and the core genome MLST is really trying to get at the subset of genes that are present in the vast majority of isolates. So ideally, you wouldn't have a situation with core genome MLST uh, where there are genes missing. Now, that's not the case with whole genome MLST. And for whole genome MLST, you're often looking at pairwise comparisons where you're simply comparing the alleles that are present in each pair. So some uh, schemes will um, omit um, uh, a whole um, loci that are not present in all of the isolates. Um, other will, others will consider them as, as ends or, or, or neutral values, um, and others will, um, uh, yeah, so basically that's what you do. So a lot depends on the scheme that you're using, and obviously that's more of an issue with whole genome MLST, and when you're trying to work out allele differences, uh, whether you count them as an N or just count them as missing, um, just depends on on the approach that you take, and realistically, I'm not sure it makes a huge amount of difference. Thanks. And from the same, uh, basically, there were three questions within one. So the third part of the question is, what about core percent? Um, I'm not sure exactly what um, what the the questioner means by core percent. Maybe they could explain um, a bit. Uh, perhaps this person could just uh, expand it further. Um, it sort of ends at that point. But let's move on to the next question in the meantime. Um, the question here is, why did you perform a hybrid sequencing in your work on Campylobacter in poultry? Is it more significant for genetic distance SNP slash uh, whole genome MLS MSLT? Yep, again, that's a great question. And, and the reason why we did that um, was because we wanted to get high quality reference genomes that were very closely related to the other genomes that we were sequencing using uh, the short read sequencing. So what we did was we selected a single isolate from four parts of the phylogenetic tree generated by the Illumina sequencing, did um, PAC bio sequencing on that, and then uh, used the Illumina data for those sequences to complete those genomes and then use those as local references uh, for further comparison. So it gave us a much more uh, higher coverage 
of a reference genome because they were so closely related to the others. Well, thank you very much. Um, then I have another question here. Uh, we still use a lot of traditional culture methods in South Africa, which is true. We use we we tend to default to ISO methods, which we then adopt as South African national standards to isolate pathogens. But in practice, we've seen that plates contain more than one colony. Uh, and it is possible that they are not all the same, in other words, clonally different, which is a concern because only one colony is usually sent for sequencing. So in such a situation, which colony would you choose? Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's a, um, an interesting one. We, and, and this is often the case, and I, I mentioned earlier uh, examples where you could get very different sequence types in your source to in your human or you get a very a, a big array of different sequence types in your source um to in your and in your human cases as well and the, and the waterborne outbreak was a very good example because the sheep fecal material that was contaminating the water was a very diverse population of campylobacter those got through but there were multiple different sequence types involved in that outbreak and and really and many of the, some of the people were in fact infected by more than one uh, sequence type too. Um, so I think if you've got um, if you think you might have quite a diffuse or uh, highly divergent source, um, then it's worth picking more than one colony off your plate. And you can use colony morphology as an indicator of likely difference in genotypes. And it's not a perfect correlation, but that's often what we'll do as a pragmatic approach would be to select colonies that appear to have a different morphology um, and then sequence those and see whether or not you have those, those differences. And it's not unusual in human cases of say Campylobacter to have uh, two and sometimes even three different sequence types from different clonal complexes. Right, yeah, thank you for that. And could, could in fact enrichment and culture bias have an influence on the outcome of outbreak investigations? Um, potentially, I mean, but we, and we've looked at this for uh, Campylobacter in particular, and, and the, the evidence really isn't, is that, um, that it doesn't really bias it very much. And, and um, I think one of the reasons is um, that the enrichment didn't tend to select, as far as we could tell, um, particular sequence types or strains over others of the target pathogens that we're interested in. So say it was a species to Juni. Um, but the other is that um, if you're using exactly the same approach in your source to your human population, um, then you're likely to have similar biases. And when we use, say, for example, Campylobacter in human cases and in the food sources, we're actually the same laboratory is using the same techniques, the same enrichment method methods um, uh, to, to look at those two as well. Um, so, and yeah, so it may not be perfect, but uh, uh, again, it's, it's just um, the, the evidence that it would seriously bias um, these kinds of investigations, I, I think, uh, it's possible, but it's it's not as likely as you might think. Right, thank you for that. Um, then there's a question here on bioinformatics software. Um, so what, what what is your opinion regarding bioinformatics software? Um, and do you recommend perhaps one supplier? Or is there also a difference between what would work better and what the authorities prefer to use? Yes, again, <laughs> a uh, uh, million dollar question. The, the, um, so as this is such a fast moving area, and this is covered in that WHO document as well, there are many, many different bioinformatics pipelines that can be used. And uh, I think I've got a, a slide actually. Um, yeah, this is just again, pointing out the different skills that you need um, for uh, in order to do these kinds of analysis. So bioinformaticians are really important, but also the software that they use. And much of the software is not accredited software either. And it also changes, it's updated and different uh, variations of the software appear over time. So it can be quite a difficult environment to nav navigate. Now, there are some uh, commercially available ones which are used commonly. And I've shown some slides in there from bio, um, Bionumerics. So this is uh, one that's commonly used in New Zealand at our uh, government um, funded laboratory that supplies uh, surveillance to the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Primary Industries. So, you know, you've got some uh, uh, potential standardization there. 
but a lot of the tools that other people use, including in government organizations, the government laboratories as well, would be uh, software um, such as Spades and Snippy produced by uh, Torsten Seaman at the University of Melbourne. He's constantly updating these. They're available through shareware, through free shareware on the web. They work incredibly well, um, but again, it's difficult to accredit and to standardize these approaches. So Binumerics is one standard commercial software, very expensive, um, but very good. Um, and then the other ones, uh, many people have their own pipelines um, and will just do, use the best available software that's out there. But there are many, many different types. This document that's on the screen here actually has a very good section on all the different bioinformatic pipelines. So if you want to have a look at those, that's, that's described on there. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, I'm glad you brought up the issue of accreditation because that was my thought, is how difficult would it be to in fact, uh, go through the process of accreditation. But uh, here is another good question, um, and it, it relates to a paper I saw not so long ago, published uh, by, I think it was by Nestle, in fact. Um, so you mentioned a lot of use for food production and processing environments. But what about services uh, when it comes to microbiological laboratories where there could be cross-contamination occurring in the actual lab? Mm. Yeah, and that's that's kind of a quality control, the lab-based quality control issue there, isn't it? Um, where you could get uh, contamination at that level. And I think, I think the point, the, the quality control is, uh, I think what I mentioned briefly uh, earlier. I won't go back to the slide, but but where where you want standardisation, accreditation, quality control, you need it throughout the entire process, uh, right the way from sample collection. You can get mixed up mix up to so the point of sample collection you get mix up in the laboratory in the in the uh, uh, in the vials that you're using for PCR amplification we see this all the time and sometimes uh, you can get all the way to producing a phylogenetic tree and you come to analyze it and you say well that just doesn't make sense that isolate these two isolates from the same premises are completely different parts of the tree and then when you go back and look at further you find it might well be a mix up in the laboratory or even at the at the sample point of sampling so I think the, the way to try and minimise that, obviously, is good through good SOPs, through good uh, through accreditation, standardisation, harmonisation, quality control. All of these uh, really should be an integral part of of the whole process, right from sample collection through to sequencing, data analysis, and interpretation. Right. Thanks very much. And then perhaps just the last question from me uh, relates to, you know, from, from an industry p p p point of view, when an industry client uh, requests whole genome sequencing to be done, um, what, what kind of uh, questions should the industry be asking when they are viewing a laboratory report in this, in this manner? Yes, and, and that, that's where I think what we're doing now is providing a lot of um, um, training, if you like, and workshopping with industry as well. So I can give you an example of where it's worked with a, a few of our industry partners here, is, is we basically um, give them an indication of, of what the technology does and what kind of questions it could answer and what samples they would need to collect and how they would need to go about it. Very often projects will start with us whole genome sequencing historical collections could be a listeria or cranobacter or whatever or you know it's a pathogen and then that gives us an idea of the population structure and then we can use that um, to say how this is how you interpret a phylogenetic tree or this is how you interpret um, a minimum spanning tree in terms of the number of allele differences so we give the set the similar kind of uh, training and it's an iterative process and then with the micro mapping we send them the maps that are interactive so they can play around with the trees and maps and timelines and raise questions and then we can address those questions with further so it's an ongoing um, dialogue that we have with the companies to help uh, interpretation and addressing any new questions that arise and also informing future sampling activities as well wow that's amazing that's a fantastic service that you are providing to the food industry we can only hope that one day, very soon, we'll be in a similar position in South Africa. So um, we have come to the end of our time. It's now just a minute past 11. And all that remains for me is to thank you profusely for this incredibly illuminating 
uh, and clarifying webinar that you have presented for us here in South Africa. And I'm sure that I speak for all the attendees that have been present for this entire uh, webinar. Um, so thank you so much, Nigel, and uh, we wish you a very, very good evening, even though it is already late in New Zealand. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lucia. It's been a real pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks, and goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.